what I want to do for just a few minutes today is take you back to the beginning of this whole deacon idea in the New Testament. I want you to turn with me in Acts chapter 6, looking at verses 1 through 7 as we think about deacons as servants of the church. Deacons, servants of the church. I would ask you to stand with me if you would and, and follow along as I read these seven verses. You may recall, if you know the chronology of the book of Acts, that in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira had been slain by the Holy Spirit for lying to the church. It was, you, know, you read along after Pentecost in chapter 2, what a great season of revival they were having, an awakening, a, a great harvest of souls, and people were sharing and caring for one another. And Ananias and Sapphira saw the delight that people took in that, and they sadly participated at a lying level, and the Holy Spirit killed them both. And a great, a great fear came upon all around who heard that this gathering of people who were followers of Jesus, who had purportedly been raised from the dead, that two people had died mysteriously in the congregation. But, but other than that, there's been no controversy in the early church. In other words, nobody fussed at the Holy Spirit for doing what he did. It was just so obvious what he did that they just, a holy hush came over them. And so we come here in Acts chapter 6. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, these Hellenists are, are Greek background Jews. They have, they have become Jews either going back far enough that, that their parents are somewhere before them, uh, converted to Judaism. They were non-Jews. They converted to Judaism. But they're of a Greek background. And, but they are Jews. The Hellenists arose against the Hebrews. These, na these native Jews. Native born Jews. Who had, who had Judaism in their, in their uh, history as far back as you could go. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There was a, remember, a mass of people flooded Jerusalem. Many were converted, thousands were converted, and they had no intention of going back home. They wanted to stay and be a part of this new fellowship of the faith. And so there were needs that arose. Feeding them was one of them. In verse 2, the, the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. What have I read to you? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. It will teach us much and remind us much. And, and my prayer is that, as it always is when we have these services, Lord, may the fruit of what the early church did to address this controversy by setting aside deacons, raising up deacons, may, may the fruit that fell then fall now. May the, may the fruit of our action here today reflect itself in 
the disciples multiplying greatly. And people, the least likely people that you would think would ever come to Christ, coming to faith in Christ. That's my prayer as we move forward in this service. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we've, if you followed this process, we called you to prayer. A couple of weeks before we offered to you a blank form to say put down on this form the, the names of men whom you believe uh, God may be setting aside to serve in the office of deacon. You responded with your nominations. We, the pastoral ministries team, took those and took the, sort of listed them in a, in a numerically high to low series of nominations and we took the top uh, nominees numerically contacted different ones and said would you be willing to be interviewed for possibility of serving on the deacon body and some said yes some said no some said not at this time so we took the yeses and worked with them did interviews and uh, prayed and here we are you voted you voted overwhelmingly the three the three men sitting before you this morning were overwhelmingly not questionably not borderline overwhelming you guys need to know that the folks that voted voted overwhelmingly for you to be set aside as a deacon in this congregation that ought to humble you and encourage you at the same time the three men before us today we, we've you you've heard us use the words installation and ordination and someone has asked me they said so what's why both those words well in the development of Baptist life I and mean, you won't find either one of these terms in the in the New Testament in the development of Baptist life ordination belongs to those we're talking about the deacon body the diaconate to those who have been set aside and are, are initially being brought into uh, the service of the deacons. So they would be ordained into that ministry. Someone who has previously been ordained in another church and has come to a, to a church and has been recognized and set aside would be installed. In other words, you don't, you don't ordain somebody twice. I, uh, you take my position. I, you, you virtually installed me as your pastor when you called me here. I'd already been previously ordained decades ago. There was no need to ordain me again. So that's the distinction, in case you're wondering. And so Joshua Askell it was previously ordained at the Heritage Baptist Church in, in uh, Shreveport, Oklahoma. He will be installed today. Jason Askell and Jerry Rosecrans will be ordained. And we're excited about that. Quickly, from this text, four things I want you to see. Just bring us back to the basics. First of all, the recognition of the need for deacons. Secondly, the response of the apostles to the need. Third, the response of the congregation to the need. Then fourth, the result of the appointment of the deacons. All right, let's look at this. The recognition of the need. This verse 1 just says there's a, a controversy arose. Some question as to whether or not there was favoritism being shown. It was, it was disrupting the unity, disrupting the fellowship. The need still exists today. We still need servants. In fact, when Paul writes, I had, had a pastor come to me years and years ago, and he was the kind of guy that seemed like he was always looking to find something that nobody else had seen in the Scripture to come up with an idea. He, so he posed me. He said, do you think deacons are a permanent office in the church? He said, I'm just wondering about that. And as I probed him, what you found out was he had some deacons in the church he was pastoring that were giving him some grief and so he, was, he, he thought the answer would be just to abolish the office of deacon. <laughs> I said, well, I, I said a couple of things. I said in 1 Timothy 3, there are qualifications for elders and for deacons given. If they want a permanent office, I don't see why that would stand there. Another thing, when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and he, he opens his greeting, in the, and we told you last week, Philippians is like the fourth from the last letter Paul writes. He writes to the overseers and the deacons at Philippi. So I think biblically you have to recognize 
that Christ has left two offices to the church. One is the, it carries the various title, bishop, overseer, uh, pastor, or elder. All the same, all the same office, different, different perspectives, different nuances. And deacon, those two offices. Anything else you add is added by the collective wisdom of a congregation. Bible study teachers, for example, you won't find the scriptures uh, saying that Bible study teachers are, are a God-ordained office, but we see the necessity of them in the flow of our Bible study ministry here. Okay? It's not wrong, you just can't place them in the same category you do elders and deacons, which Christ left. So there's the need. Let me say parenthetically, and it's not true here now, but I've served long enough and know enough pastors who've served that sadly, sometimes there's a reverse of this where, where deacons are, are elected and set aside and then a controversy arises. Uh, that's not supposed to be that way. Deacons are supposed to be folks who put out fires, not fire starters. So I'm excited uh, to see this, see our deacon body growing to to share the load in the ministry, to, to more effectively help me reach with hands and feet and eyes and ears. I'm excited about that. But there is this recognition for the need. Secondly, there's the response of the apostles to the need. It was brought to their attention. Let's commend them for not ignoring it and say, well, you know, people, that's just the way some people are. They have to work it out among themselves. They didn't ignore it. Nor did they think the answer was to, to set aside more apostles. They recognized the wisdom. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. That is, they, they called together the church at, at, at Jerusalem. Said, here's this situation that's been brought to our attention. We can do one of two things. We could ourselves absorb ourselves with it. But in our in our Collective apostolic judgment. You have to know that these men have sought the Lord on this. It does not seem right that we should engage and deal with this controversy. Surely the body is equipped with people who can deal with controversy. So they said, therefore, brothers, since this, we, we don't believe our Minds ought to be divided between preaching the word, the preparation for that, what they go ahead and say later, the, the ministry of prayer and preaching. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men, and they give these three descriptives. We know the qualifications come up in 1 Timothy 3, 8 and following. But here, in, the, in what someone has described as this, these were the, these were the proto-deacons. These, these are your first deacons uh, set aside. The term is not used, but clearly the function there from what you follow through the scripture. These were your first deacons. They're, they need to be men of good reputation. They don't need to be shady men. They need to be men tried and true. Men you can trust. So of good repute, full of the Spirit. They need to be Spirit-filled men. Men who daily repent of their sinful shortcomings. Who daily seek the favor of the Lord. You know, the filling of the Spirit, by the way, it's not a sermon on this, but... Paul says in Ephesians, keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's a, it's a continual reality. It's not a, there's not a one-time thing where you say, yeah, I, I, was, I was filled with the Spirit back. No, no. It's a continual, and, and the, put together what the New Testament teaches about it, it's a, it's a conscious daily emptying oneself of oneself, of, 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 of carnal motives, of, of, of carnal agendas, personal agendas, and praying to be filled with the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to commune with the Spirit, so that when you listen, you listen with spiritual ears. When you see, you see with spiritual eyes. When you speak, you speak spiritually to issues, not carnally. Full of the Spirit. 
and wisdom. And of course, wisdom we know, uh, the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Wisdom we know is, is, is right knowledge applied to the glory of God. You see, wisdom, uh, you can know a lot of things. And we do, we all know a lot of things. But it's how we take what we know and apply it so that God is glorified and His purposes are exalted and advanced. Wisdom. Now remember, folks, this the thing that excites me is this church had not been around very long. <laughs> this is a new church. And yet, normatively, already in this church, there were those who could be, and I don't think they found just the only ones that could be found. There were those who had a, already a reputation well established, a life spirit filled, wise. They basically say, you pick them out, you select them by, by congregational vote, and then we will appoint them, we will, we will set them apart. And then they said, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so, Folks, it's not, it's not that apostles, and by, by application of that today, it's not that pastors don't serve and don't serve needs and don't deal with controversies. And it's not that deacons don't, don't engage in prayer and, and ministering the Word. That's not it at all. It's just that there is a, there is a division of a priority that a, a pastor, or pastors ought to be able to count on a body of deacons to engage in the caring of the congregation. Just like two of our men rushing to see Eldon Cook in the hospital. That's wonderful. Lord willing, I'll be by to see him. But how wonderful to know that men have already been there, prayed with him, keeping up with him. That's, we're talking about caring for needs, and that's what deacons do. And they, to their very best ability, address them and solve them, remediate them. Third, look at the response of the congregation. This is exciting too. These are people who initially were troubled. They were frustrated. The, we think the Hellenist ladies are being gypped in the distribution of the food. Well, look at verse 5. What they said pleased the whole gathering. So what, what happened? Look at the movement here. You had unity, then controversy, which was disrupting the unity, uh, threatening the unity. And then you had a, a wise, godly suggestion embraced by the congregation so that now we see unity again. See the movement? A congregation that is being led by the Spirit, by Spirit-filled leaders, moves that way. It doesn't mean that there will never be controversies. That there will be. But it means that they should be addressed spiritually, and when they are addressed spiritually, the congregation will see the wisdom in that. They'll be glad of that, and unity will, will come. You won't, you won't lose unity. You won't, you won't say, well, we'll never get that back. That's just not true of a church of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is what? A message of repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. If I ever get to the day where I can't forgive you, you ever get to the day where you can't forgive me or forgive one another, something's radically wrong with the Christianity we espouse. Daily repenting, daily forgiving. And then look at this, fourthly, the result of the appointment. And this always fires me up when I read this. So they did this. They, the, the, verse 6 says, they set them before the apostles. The apostles prayed, laid their hands on them. And they were recognized then as the, they weren't called deacons then, but they were the troubleshooters in the church at Jerusalem. Problem arose, gets the ears of the apostles, they say you need to talk to one of these men. Look at the result. Verse 7, the word of God continued to increase. Remember there had been a hush over things because of the death of, of Ananias and Sapphira. None dared join them, Acts 5 tells us. The Word of God continued to increase, in other words, continued to have effect, continued to move forward, to branch out. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. 
Oh, that's my, that's my heart's desire. It's interesting when you look, the, part of the multiplication of growth of the early church was the church recognizing the need for deacons and the men selected. When only blessed by God, it became a blessing to the congregation and there was a great encouragement to share again. We know if we read forward that, that Stephen will, will go out sharing and he will be, he will be stoned. Philip will go out and, and he will get to preach an incredible revival meeting. They were greatly used of God. And then a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. If you made a list in first century Jerusalem of the least likely people to ever embrace Christianity, near the top of the list would have been the priests. <laughs> These fellows who were trained in Judaism, who, whose labor, whose livelihood was on, on every seventh day to lead the Jewish people in worship of the true and living God, Jehovah, whose ancillary responsibility was to tell the people under their charge that this movement called the way, this assertion that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God who, who cru was crucified and rose three days later, they were to put that down. They were to squelch that. They were to tell the people not to believe that. A great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I don't, I don't know what you put in the place of that today. Just in your own mind, fill in the blank of the people you know, you work around, you see, you hear about, who you would say, these are the hardest hearts, the most antagonistic people to Christianity. And those people, by God's grace, were saved as an outflow of the church being wise. Now, I believe you've been wise in who you have told us that you would like to see raised up, set apart, to join the deacon body. And I would ask you to pray with me as you pray for these men. And we're going to, we're going to charge these men in a few moments and we're going to question them and we're going to charge you, the congregation, and we're going to question you. That as you pray for these men, make a part of your prayer, Lord, Please honor our action here by multiplying the disciples and by saving the least likely people who in our minds, whether the list is on paper or it's in our minds, the people we would say least likely to come to Christ. Honor that, Lord. Show your power here. May the unity we have here increase and strengthen and enlarge and reach farther as it did in that day, in the days of the early church.